Ecology or Catastrophe, The Life of Murray Bookchin, by Janet Beale, published by Oxford University Press, 2015. Chapter 4, Echo Decentralist Bookchin did not share Weber's animus toward New York. His childhood in East Tremont had been idyllic, with its close-knit ethnic community and beautiful park. The neighborhood was still congenial, as he saw every day when he went to give his mother her insulin injection. The deli was still selling pickles and whitefish and knishes, and he could still hear Yiddish murmured as he passed strangers on the sidewalk. His old YCL comrades were long gone, but their parents still lived there, and why would they move, when the buildings were rent-controlled? Rose Bookchin, nearly blind from diabetes, still lived in the four-story brick building on 175th Street. In early December 1952 a city agency announced that a six-lane highway was to be constructed through East Tremont, called the Cross Bronx Expressway. Apartment buildings that stood on the right-of-way would be torn down. A letter from the city, signed by Robert Moses, informed the residents that they had 90 days to leave. Rose's building wasn't on the list, but thousands of her neighbors were forced, tearfully to leave. The abandoned buildings were boarded up and vandalized, then came the wrecking ball. Now when Murray visited Rose he could look eastward and see the earth-moving machines and bulldozers coming ever closer. Construction crews used dynamite to level the hills on which East Tremont stood. The staccato of jackhammers and dynamite surely plagued Rose. East Tremonters called the dust and grit that got in their pores fallout. The kosher butcher, the green grocer, and the other shopkeepers boarded up their storefronts and joined the exodus. Construction of the Cross Bronx Expressway destroyed what was left of Murray's childhood utopia. For about 15 years now, Robert Moses, New York's veritable dictator of public works, had been ripping up working-class neighborhoods to build highways, tunnels, and bridges. Many other American cities, too, were being remade on behalf of the automobile and some concept of efficiency. Starting in 1949, the Federal Urban Renewal Program had been designating old neighborhoods, mainly immigrant and working-class communities, as blighted, congested slums. That label became a warrant for sending in bulldozers to clear the way for erecting functional towers of glass and steel in anonymous, antiseptic concrete plazas. Why these incomprehensible acts of civic violence? How could perfectly good, humane communities be destroyed on behalf of inhumane high-rises? For insight into the nature and workings of cities, Bookchin first turned to the writings of his oldest teachers, Marx and Engels. As he poured through their books, several passages leaped out at him. The whole economic history of society can be summed up, Marx had written, in a rather uncharacteristic passage, by the development of the antithesis between town and country. And Engels had observed that this town-country antithesis had arisen as a direct necessity for industrial and agricultural production. In other words, this urban problem was connected to the problem of industrial agriculture, and both were connected to capitalism. Lewis Mumford's The Culture of Cities, 1938, gave Bookchin further insight. In medieval times, Mumford had written, small, close-knit European cities had been human in scale with irregular streets and low-slung houses. They were attractive, communal, and traversable on foot. In their many green spaces, people could gossip, trade, pray, and politic face to face. Over the centuries, however, as kings created bureaucracies and standing armies and centralized authority in the nation-state, these humane small cities had given gave way to Baroque, imperial cities, whose layout consisted of straight lines and rigorous visual axes. Thereafter, said Mumford, as capitalism and authority corrupted civilization, urban history continued to deteriorate, culminating in today's gigantic cities, organized for power and money. Bookchin was inspired by both Marx and Mumford to write his own narrative of urban decline. The high point, in his view, was not the medieval communes but the small cities of ancient Attica, in the first millennium BCE. These polis, notably Athens, had existed in balance with the surrounding countryside, 
their inhabitants had firm ties to the soil and were independent in their economic position, which gave them a strong, self-reliant character. Economically the ancient Athenians produced simple goods to meet their basic needs and nothing more. From this arrangement had arisen a remarkable political culture, with democratic assemblies and an exceptionally high degree of public participation. Much later, with the rise of modernity in Europe, cities became commercial and industrial enterprises. Civic and communal life deteriorated, as buying and selling displaced other social roles. Products of workmanship became objects of exchange, or commodities, while traditional social relations yielded to relations of exchange. As the market moved to the center of social life, the quest for profits became the overriding endeavor. Cities, as the venues for this historic transmutation, became dehumanized, and by the 1950s, their pathology had become extreme. They were too big, gigantic, megalopolis. Housing was scarce and shoddy. Traffic congestion had reached the point of dysfunction. The subways were overcrowded and unreliable. Office work was monotonous and sedentary, stifled by tedium, urban workers had come to resemble machines, enslaved, insecure, and one-sided. City dwellers encountered one another in passing, with mutual indifference or mistrust. The giant city was a mere aggregate of dispirited people scattered among cold, featureless structures. No wonder Weber couldn't sleep. Nerves that were battered and raw from the noise were further assailed by advertising. And the automobile was everywhere. An expressway like the Cross Bronx reduced people to mere byproducts of the highway and motor car. New Yorkers were being forced to surrender residential space, parks, avenues, and air to a steel vehicle that looks more like a missile than a means of human transportation. As a result of the automobile urban air is seriously in some cases dangerously polluted, taking a toll on human health. Meanwhile, the separation of town and country necessitated the use of ever more chemicals in food production, not only pesticides and fertilizers and herbicides, to maintain monocultures, but also preservatives, to prevent deterioration during shipping, and food colorings, to create the appearance of freshness. As long as cities are separated from the countryside, Book Chin wrote, food will necessarily include deleterious chemicals to meet problems of storage, transportation, and mass manufacture, not to mention profit. The separation of town and country was intimately connected to the problem of chemicals in food. Book Chin concluded that the possibilities of the city are exhausted and can never be revitalized. The city had reached its limits. The megalopolis had become a fetter on civilization, and humanity in order to advance, must burst that chain. But what pattern of settlement would replace the gigantic city? Lewis Mumford, when writing of alternatives, had been inspired by the work of the English garden city advocate Ebenezer Howard, the Scottish urban planner Patrick Geddes, and the Russian anarchist Peter Kropotkin, all of whom around the turn of the century had proposed creating green settlements, small, human-scale communities that were surrounded by open swaths of countryside dedicated to recreation and to agriculture that produced food for local consumption, that farmed on soils enriched by urban refuse, and that made use of urban market gardens. Following these predecessors, Mumford proposed that new cities should have green belts and parklands, combining the hygienic advantages of the open suburbs with the social advantages of the big city. Book Chin thought that creating new green cities in hitherto rural areas would be excellent but went further to propose decentralization, breaking up the giant metropolises into small, highly integrated, free communities of people whose social relations are blemished neither by property nor production for exchange. Humanistic in scale and appearance, the new small cities would be integrated with the surrounding landscape. Their inhabitants would have easy access to farmlands, where they could raise crops and savor rural recreation. This ecological, decentralized society would have no need for chemicals in food. In fields that were small in scale crops could be rotated, requiring no fertilizers, and crop diversity, as opposed to monocultures, would render pesticides unnecessary. The short distance between farm and marketplace would eliminate the need for preservatives and colorings.
agriculture would remain mechanized to reduce toil, but with the absence of chemicals, it could once again become organic, a concept that Bookchin absorbed from Sir Albert Howard's 1940 book, An Agricultural Testament. The integration of town and country would enhance social solidarity as well as intimacy between people and land. People could develop a robust character like that of the ancient Athenians, creative and civic-minded, governing their small communities in equilibrium with the natural world. Communities would produce goods solely to meet human needs and promote man's welfare. Profit-seeking would yield to social responsibility. If all these considerations were making eco-decentralization desirable and necessary technological advances were making it possible. Rather than depending on dangerous and centralizing nuclear power, communities could make maximum use of their own energy resources, such as wind power, solar energy, and hydroelectric power. Thanks to miniaturization and electronics, giant factories could be dismantled, replaced by small-scale automated production facilities, the smoky steel town is an anachronism. Excellent steel can be made and rolled with installations that occupy about two or three city blocks. And since the machines would do most of the work, people would have to work only a few hours a day, allowing for the self-assertion of a spiritually independent and free personality. The pace of life would be more relaxed, set not by production schedules but by bodily and daily cycles. People could actually enjoy life, having unrestricted access to the countryside as well as the town, to soil as well as to pavement, to flora and fauna as well as to libraries and theaters. They would not suffer social or intellectual privation. Thanks to the telephone, people can now communicate with one another over a distance of thousands of miles in a matter of seconds. And thanks to trains and planes, we can travel to the most remote areas of the world in a few hours. As a result of modern mass communication and transportation, the obstacles created by space and time are essentially gone. By all these means, eco-decentralization could open magnificent vistas for individual and social development. It would not only promote human health and fitness but lead to a long-range balance between man and the natural world. The human personality could expand. Today's desensitized urban robots would be released from their insecurities, greed, and competitiveness and in their place develop self-confidence, a sense of moral responsibility, and cooperation. Genius could once again flourish, as it had in ancient Athens. Above all, people in the eco-decentralist society would have the free time to participate civically, to govern themselves. At some point in the early 1950s, Bookchin came across H.D.F. Kiddo's The Greeks, which describes ancient Athens in ways that resemble Bookchin's ideal society. In the ancient polis, wrote Kiddo, town and country were closely knit, and cities were built to a human scale. Production was for use, and wasteful consumption did not exist, three quarters of the things which we slave for the Greeks simply did without. And needs for energy were met by the sun. As a result, ancient Athenians, or rather, their male citizens, had abundant leisure time, which the climate allowed them to spend outdoors. Women, slaves, and resident aliens did not, alas, enjoy these privileges. The typical Athenian man, said Kitto, was able to sharpen his wits and improve his manners through constant intercourse with his fellows. Talk was the breath of life to the Greek, rather like Crotona Park and Union Square in the 1930s, Bookchin might have thought. The political institution that organized Athenian sociability was the Ecclesia, the democratic assembly in which all male citizens were legal equals, with equal rights to debate and vote on issues of communal concern and equal rights to hold political office. Such an assembly, which would of course be modified to include all adult residents, including women and ethnic minorities, seemed to Bookchin to be the proper governing institution for the eco-decentralist society. It would be, he wrote, democratic in content not only in form. Once again Bookchin had done Weber's spade work for him. Weber had complained about tasteless food, Bookchin theorized an ecological society that would produce wholesome, organic food to delight his palate. Weber had complained about New York's noise and cockroaches, 
Buk Chin was ready to break up the city for him and disperse its pieces around the countryside. Weber had called for a utopia where machines eliminated toil, Buk Chin thought out that utopia's social fabric. Weber had called for organizational transparency and freedom of expression, Buk Chin identified its institutional form, the Democratic Citizens' Assembly. In short, Buk Chin provided the content for the movement for a democracy of content. He and he alone had carried out the Trotsky-inspired rethinking that the CI group had been formed to undertake. But sometime in the mid-1950s, Weber began to seem strangely distant from Bookchin's work, even uninterested. Perhaps he was annoyed that his protege and heir had dropped the world plan. When Bookchin pressed a copy of Kitto on Weber and urged him to read about ancient Athenian assemblies, Weber dismissed the whole notion of assembly democracy as dilettantism. And when Bookchin explained his eco-decentralist ideas, Weber complained that the group was confused over theoretical questions, we have de facto no theory. Despite Weber's rudeness to him, Buk Chin tried to keep himself intellectually interesting to his mentor. He wrote up his ideas on town and country in an article called The Limits of the City, in which he sketched the city's evolution over the millennia, from the village and the Athenian polis to the imperial city, the bourgeois city, and finally the megalopolis. His narrative treated each kind of city as a phase or moment of a larger urban process that unfolded dialectically. He submitted the article for publication in CI. On the day the group discussed the article they said it was excellent, at first. Then Weber weighed in. The article was too historical, he pronounced. All those pages on the history of Attica were nothing more than useless scholarship. Book Chin defended the emphasis on history. It was necessary to show how the Athenian polis had come into existence so that readers could understand it. Nonsense, Weber might have said. History can teach us only a few things, which have by now become truisms at best, and most of it is a bourgeois fetish. But Joe, Book Chin might have protested, much of Marx's capital is about the history of capitalism. You can't really know something's nature unless you know its history, its development, how it emerged from what came before. That's the dialectic. But, Weber might have replied. The present is what matters. Suppose you were talking about slavery. You wouldn't have to describe the history of slavery in order to oppose it, it would be enough to describe accurately what modern slavery is. To which Book Chin might have argued that a utopian must be interested in studying history at least for its turning points, the moments in history where things might have taken a different and better turn. What if Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht had survived the attack of January 1919 and given the German working class real leadership? What if the Stalinists and the Social Democrats had joined forces electorally in 1933 and prevented Hitler from becoming Chancellor? These were crossroads, moments of potentiality where humanity could have gone in a different direction. It's crucial to recognize them and learn from them, Book Chin would have insisted. The what-ifs of history are irrelevant, Weber might have snapped, in history, it is exclusively a matter of what has actually happened, not of what might have occurred under different circumstances and conditions. To disparage such counterfactuals, he quoted from his beloved Diderot's Jacques L.E. Fatalist, if, 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 if the sea boiled, you'd have a lot of cooked fish. Under the force of Weber's arguments, group members who had initially praised the limits of the city reversed themselves. They echoed Weber's condemnation of the article as too historical and even academic. Its historical section contributes nothing to our understanding of the present state of the cities, said one. Either we deal with contemporary issues, or we cease to be contemporary issues. Buchin's good friend Dave Eisen rose to defend the article as a striking interpretation of the significance of the city in civilization. The debate over this article was strangely bitter, but in the end, Weber vetoed its publication. It surely consoled Bookchin when news arrived that the problem of chemicals in food was to be published as a book in Germany. The translator, Gotzoli, said he hoped it would serve as a warning signal lest this lunacy, chemicals in food, affect Germany as well. For Book Chin, it must have been a much needed validation.
when Stalin died in 1953, the group had rejoiced. In February 1956 the Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev, denounced Stalin's dictatorship and admitted that the 1930s Moscow show trials had been frame-ups. Half a year later, on October 23, Hungarian workers rose up in revolt against the Kremlin. They went on a general strike and formed Soviets, not authoritarian ones but democratic ones, as in 1917. Hungary seemed poised to free itself from Russian control. The Hungarian insurgents appealed to the West for help, broadcasting desperate appeals by radio for arms and ammunition. For nearly a decade, Western diplomats had been assuring Eastern Europeans that should they rise up against their Russian suzerains, the West would lavish them with aid. So they had every reason to expect their appeal to be heard. But Western governments reneged and sent no aid. Horrified, CI formed the Emergency Committee for Arms to Hungary to demand that the US government airdrop weapons to the insurgents. Bookchin was the principal spokesperson. In early November he wrote a leaflet admonishing Westerners not to allow the brave Hungarian rebels to perish, by forcing them to fight tanks with pistols and armored cars with pitchforks. It was one of those crossroads moments that could change history, arming the rebels could help topple the Russian dictatorship. Hungarian expatriates in New York and Boston arranged a speaking tour of New England for Book Chin, who orated to thousands. But by November 4, Soviet tanks had crushed the rebellion. CI mourned the demise of the bold uprising and the deaths of the heroic insurgents. The revolt had been particularly inspiring and illuminating in the context of the otherwise quiescent 1950s. The young Hungarians, Book Chin mused, had grown up entirely under a Stalinist regime and had never known other social dispensations. Yet they had taken up arms in insurrection. If they could do it, then maybe we had reason to hope that revolutionaries could emerge closer to home as well. The CI group leavened their hard work with dashes of pantagruelism. The Bookchins and the Grossmans vacation together in the Great Smoky Mountains. In 1956 CI heirs with theatrical inclinations formed the Grub Street Players, who performed obscure plays by Cervantes and Boccaccio in the living rooms where the group met. The most elaborate production was an 18th-century farce called The Cornish Squire, performed on December 28, 1957. As they had hoped, Weber loved it. But there was no denying it, the CI group was growing depressed. By 1958, they had been working together for ten years. They had produced several dozen issues of the magazine, and they had discussed politics and culture intensively twice a week. Stop the Bomb and Arms for Hungary had gained them attention and respect. But the magazine had not become a collection point for social resistance, the New York group was still only about 20 strong. No movement for a democracy of content had emerged. In four years of serious political agitation, Jack Grossman pointed out, referring to 1954-58, we have not succeeded in making one CIER out of the many people with whom we were in touch. The result had been a perceptible demoralization in breeding with the same old faces the same predictable attitudes. Readers, for their part, complained that they couldn't figure out where to place CI on the ideological spectrum. Who are you really? and what do you want, they asked. CI's ideological openness, which had been intended to generate discussion and creativity made for an incoherent presentation. Weber, increasingly irate blamed the CI heirs for the lack of progress. They didn't think before they speak, he complained to his friends in London and Germany and South Africa, they didn't listen carefully and register what has been said, and so engaged in a lot of valueless talk and outright nonsense. He claimed the group would fall apart without him. Least of all did he admit that his own difficult personality might have been an obstacle to movement building. As Murray told me, people tended to drop away from the group rather than challenge Weber on anything. Weber's insulting remarks about CI heirs are particularly insensitive in the light of their loyalty to him, indeed their financial support for him. Certainly they were not the Frankfurt School, which was what Murray, in later years, suspected Weber had wanted them to become.
but they were committed activists who were defying the spirit of their times to try to build a broad democratic movement. If they failed, it was not for lack of diligent effort and self-sacrificing dedication on their part. But in the prosperous 1950s, most Americans weren't interested in hearing social critique, let alone in reducing their consumption. In the absence of a radical atmosphere in the country Grossman conceded grimly it is doubtful that many people will be one to the revolutionary perspective of our movement. As Weber got sicker, he lost interest in searching out possibilities for radical political change in contemporary issues. Instead, he issued sweeping condemnations of the present, which deserved greater contempt than any other historical epoch. Even though all the necessary conditions for utopia were in place, he groused, social life remains a sea of blood, dirt, baseness, irrationality, and misery. He denounced whole fields of intellectual inquiry like psychology, which was merely a replacement for religion as an attempt to make people feel guilty. Scientists were morally bankrupt, they took comfortable jobs in industry and allowed their work to be used for H-bombs, guided missiles, gases and bacteria for warfare, jet fighters, insecticides, chemicals, and so on. Even his one-time dialectical heroes Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno had sold out, producing useless scholasticism for officialdom and sometimes even stooping to issue ordinary official propaganda. They had succumbed to the positivism they had once criticized and were now ruled by the law of ignorance. Under capitalism, Weber concluded, true social consciousness was obtainable only by individuals who refused to blindly or exclusively follow narrow economic and political interests, that is, people like himself. He, after all, had never taken a paycheck from officialdom, the way the Frankfurt schoolers had, and thus he remained independent and free of taint. That he took paychecks from his protege Chet Manis didn't seem to matter. Against the money-grubbing society he compared himself to the philosopher Spinoza, a man of character who had stood up for his convictions and refused to sell his soul. Weber's conceit became sickening, Murray told me. People who weren't willing to flatter him or feed his vanity it seemed, no longer had any place in the group. Chet Manis, who had taken a second job in order to support Weber financially, never flagged in his adoration of his mentor. But for years he had resented Weber's designation of Book Chin as his heir. Manis thought he himself deserved that honor. As he brooded over the injustice, his annoyance grew. Finally he made a decision, he would no longer hand his second paycheck over to Weber. That left Weber without an income. The CIRs would have happily pooled their resources to support him, they agreed, but their own incomes were meager, and many of them now had families. They encouraged Weber to apply for disability payments, he could surely qualify, with his heart condition. But Weber refused, saying he could not endure the humiliation of taking public assistance. Evidently he preferred Chet Manis's paychecks. So he withdrew his designation of Book Chin as his heir. Thereafter, Weber's rudeness to Book Chin intensified. Murray would ask a question, and Weber would reply curtly, if at all, and walk away. No matter what Murray wrote, Weber criticized it. He vetoed publication of yet another paper by Book Chin, this one called The Decline of the Proletariat, on the non-revolutionary nature of the working class, a favorite theme of Weber's, in earlier times, which perhaps had been Buchin's point in writing it. Then Weber started bad-mouthing Buchin behind his back, to his friends overseas. He was a mere journalist, look at all that plotting research on those congressional hearings. He was a mere agitator, look at those futile speeches on behalf of the Hungarian uprising. And he was an amateur, look at that interminable historical article on Athenian democracy. Such dilettanti as Murray, he complained in a letter, will always attempt to overbridge their insecurity by explaining everything which they don't understand. And he still hadn't finished the goddamn world plan. He stepped up his attacks, accusing Book Chin of being used up and a disastrous human failure who would never write again. Unervingly to Murray, Things he hadn't told anyone except his wife Beatrice were suddenly coming out of Weber's mouth. Book Chin was crushed. Why had Weber turned against him?
the best thing CI had produced, Stop the Bomb, Arms for Hungary and Echo Decentralism, had been his contributions. What had he ever done to Weber, except love him too much? In the late 1950s, a CIER named Jack Schwartz, who was a mathematician, developed a model to test the validity of Marx's labor theory of value. He ran the numbers, and the theory failed. He concluded that the economic analysis in capital was incorrect. He wrote a paper and in September 1956 presented it to one of the Saturday night meetings. The blood must have roared in Weber's head as he listened. Yes, Marx had been wrong about proletarian revolution, but his economic analysis, Weber believed, remained unsurpassed. He rebuked Schwartz, saying he didn't understand capital. Explain it, then. Schwartz insisted. You said you wanted dialogue and argumentation. Weber dismissed the whole discussion as impossible and the level of insight as appallingly low. But Schwartz refused to be brushed off and kept the argument going for weeks. Group members took sides, no one willing to concede. Weber proposed that they agree to disagree, but Schwartz refused, saying that the group must admit that he was right, and that Marx's theory of value was false. If they did not, then I will split. Weber seethed, Schwartz can't find rest until he has conquered fame for himself. But he had to be answered. Who would do it? Bookchin must have seen his chance to win back Weber's approval. He volunteered, stepping back into his old role as Weber's researcher. He was neither a mathematician nor an economist, but by now he was accustomed to self-education. For Weber's sake, he spent the winter of 1956-57 poring over capital and making notes. At length he drafted a reply arguing that Swartz's error was to ignore the social dimension of Marx's labor theory of value, he occupied himself with relations between things, not between people. Bookchin presented his paper to the group that April. Jack Grossman applauded it as one of the finest expositions of the significance of labor in political economy ever produced but Weber denounced it as shallow and unacceptable and he ripped into Bookchin for being like the dog behind the stove. It was because of Bookchin, he said maliciously that CI was degenerating. Murray was speechless. He still loved his old mentor, even with all his flaws. Despite his cruelty he couldn't bear to fight him or even criticize him. Bookchin's relationship with Weber was further strained by Bookchin's belief, shared by Millie Weber, according to Murray, that Weber and Beatrice had become romantically attracted to each other. He faced the prospect of losing both his father figure and his wife. As a refugee from Nazism, Weber learned, he was entitled to compensation from the West German government, enough to live on. In 1958 he abruptly left New York and returned to his native country. The CI group, shocked by his treatment of Murray, gave him no send-off. But even from across the Atlantic, Weber did not let up, writing letters to the CI group attacking Book Chin. In October 1958 he mocked supposedly joyless revolutionaries who use their wives for their own ends. Let, then, the wife find a satisfactory sexual relation, especially with a man who is not a pig. On and on he ranted, accusing this unnamed revolutionary of suffering from Saturnalia of neurosis and pathological perversion. That letter shocked even Weber's devotees in the New York group and fomented hatred against Joe that was difficult to imagine, wrote one of them. Dave Eisen protested Weber's venomous personal attack. He begged Weber to empty your pen of vitriol and conduct the discussion henceforth upon another plane. Weber responded by laying it on even thicker. By now he was posturing as Jacques L.E. Fatalist, Diderot's hero who had extolled adultery as the highest form of morality. Prohibitions of adultery Weber complained, always lead to submission to authorities like the state, the church, or, at the end, even the husband. He even tried to associate monogamy with capitalism, under capitalism's artificially maintained economy of scarcity, he wrote physical and moral compulsion enforce sexual privation, while sex guilt supports an economy of scarcity. Without compunction, 
he invoked cherished political ideas to justify his personal agenda. Bookchin would later tell me he thought Weber was trying to take C.I. down with him. He was right, I found in my research. I decided to let it die of its own stupidity Weber remarked in a 1959 letter, dismissing his years with these friends, admirers, supporters, and disciples as years of endless effort with the result of an incredible mess. He had taught and inspired them, then tried to destroy them. The group continued to meet, if nothing else in sheer defiance of his prediction that C.I. couldn't survive without him. Then, in the summer of 1959, news arrived that on July 16, Joseph Weber, in Germany had died of a heart attack at the age of 58. But by now the CI group that had once revered him as a successor to Trotsky had come to despise him. His early death rescued Bookchin from that toxic relationship. Sorting out all the wild and bitter emotions would take years. But in the end, Bookchin would generously decide that he preferred to remember Weber as he had been at his best, before illness warped his mind, and to value him as his mentor but for now he had to stanch the bleeding.